Welcome everybody and thank you very much for coming to our meeting, Eureka Meet. As usual, I share my screen just to go over a few uh, announcements. So here we go. Um, greetings, as I say. Uh, it's Bob Hawks with uh, Bob Hawks. Bob, I'll uh, start again. Yep. Bob Hawkinson is speaking to us tonight. As you see there, what opportunities are there for inventors and innovators when considering the role plastic plays in product development and manufacture? And should we be thinking beyond the use of plastic? Now, that's quite confining for a man like Bob because he's quite an amazingly talented person who's got all sorts of experience, which I, I'm sure Bob, please tell us more about that. Um, uh, I've got a few announcements that I usually make. Um, our meeting format for tonight, Bob will take over. So we've got to get ready to listen. It's a Zoom meeting, so please, please keep your cameras on. Mute as usual. We are recording, as you know. Our disclaimers are in place. It's your decision to use what you do with the information you may learn, and it's your responsibility. Well, this is South Africa, electricity rules, but tonight we're okay. We don't have load shedding. So thank you very much to our host, Janine Preston. Janine is actually recording for us tonight. Bob, the quote that I've got for you, I say thanks to John Skaggs for this idea, is before anything else, preparation is the key to success. And I remember that when we were discussing this meeting earlier, you were saying that without your market having been sorted, without you knowing who you are inventing for, well, there's not much to go ahead with. So I thought that was quite an appropriate quote for you. Uh, coming up, we've got um, our speaker for the 21st of September, Sean Moy. He's um, a sportsman himself, and he's the inventor of the eSports trainer product. And his, his query would be, or his title of his speech will be, um, can sportsmen and women be inventors too? And what opportunities are there? There's a lot more to be said about that, but we would welcome on the 21st. Tonight, however, we've got Bob. Thank you very much, Bob. A couple of other announcements we've got, I'm very thrilled to say, Stephen Key, who will be in Johannesburg on the 25th of October. Um, it, we're doing a virtual as well as an in-person uh, show, and he's going to be giving an excellent overview of the whole of the licensing um, model as a, as a business model for inventors. You need to book via Quicket. And if you want to go via Quicket, you just go Quicket Stephen Key and you'll go straight to the page that you need. Then you can actually uh, follow the links that are there. Our next picture to the panel is the 29th of October. We are open to our international friends. So please ask me more details about it if you're interested. And then we've got our, my last uh, announcement tonight um, is our design competition for our kids. Safi Paul has sponsored this. What the kids have to do is design something using plastic, repurposed, <coughs> reused, but they've got to design something that makes learning fun, makes school fun, uh, make, makes, makes it easy to remember things when you've got to do maybe boring things at school or whatever it is. But it's a fun competition and it ends on the 31st of October. Super prizes are coming up. So if you happen to know of any kids, please just pass on the word. Without too much more ado then, um, I'm gonna hand over to Bob and say thank you very much, Bob. Yeah, it's absolutely. really, really great to have you with us. Um, I'm thrilled, so. Thank you, Celeste. I appreciate all the kind words too. I, uh... Um, I'm actually kind of going to school on you a little bit here also, uh, Dennis and Karen. I don't please know. show off, please show off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I'm looking at trying to figure out how to do some Zoom meetings and things. So I'm going to school a little bit on you guys here. I'm learning from you today too, so. Oh, no, uh, goodness me. Yeah, yeah, good stuff. So, um, so uh, I think, was it Ken that talked about the, uh, being an inventor and always it's you're always coming up with something and it's almost a 
uh, guy that sort of talked me into starting this group, uh, Henry, he used to always say that inventing is a sickness. It just, it just consumes you, right? Cause you're always trying to come up with better ways and, and things. And, and sometimes it just, uh, it's hard to be in the moment, right? Because you're always thinking about something in the future. But anyway, I just want to go real quick over sort of my background. Um, I, uh, I've i been self-employed since I was 19. I'm 59 now. God, that sounds so old. Um, <laughs> been doing this a long time. Um, and so I own a commercial uh, landscaping company where we do plant installation, irrigation, fruit and pest control, uh, maintenance, uh, for commercial properties. So we have about probably 65 employees. Um, and so the interesting thing about my industry is that when I was younger and you're sitting on a lawnmower, all you do is think, right? You, you, you're not talking to anybody. So you're, you're not conversing with anybody. You're just thinking about things, right? So I, I would always tell you that you kind of almost need your your thinking space, if that makes sense, uh, when you're you're trying to come up with stuff. But um, so I've 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 been a I've been in this business a long time. I've had a lot of employees. I've seen a lot of things that uh, that I can improve upon, and um, so it led me to ultimately, like I say, Henry uh, gentleman in our group, uh, sadly he passed. He's a really good guy, but he, he invented a lot of really cool stuff. And, um, but he kept telling me, you got to start an inventors group, got to start an inventors group, got to start an inventors group. And I said, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> ultimately acquiesced. And I'm, I'm really glad I did because we get to meet some really cool people. Uh, Dennis is doing some really cool things. Karen's doing some really cool things. Um, and we have a lot of, we have a lot of really, really sharp people. And, and what's interesting is that when you get into a group and uh, I think, uh, who was it? The other gentleman was talking about that earlier is that you wind up sharing a lot of ideas. You help each other. You try and find sources for each other or you find new sources. Um, so our inventors group has been going, I don't know, for maybe five or six years, shut it down for about two years at COVID. We've had two meetings so far since, and they've all been in person. And um, I'm excited to try and get it back together. It's just, it does take time, as you know, um, and I work work a lot of hours. Um, so my whole goal with my landscaping business is to be able to get it to where I have really good people here and, and I can get it to run mostly on its own. I mean, uh, and that it frees me up to pursue what I'm doing on this side of the equation. Um, so one of the things that I always talk to and Dennis and Karen have probably heard this, um, when I talk about, people come to me all the time and go, well, what about a, you know, I wanna do this and I think this is an amazing product and uh, the whole world's gonna want one. And uh, so I always say, well, how big is your market, right? Um, it might be cool if you have the most amazing widget maker in the world, but if you're only going to sell 12 of them, uh, you can't sustain unless you're going to sell them for half a million dollars a piece, right? So you need to be aware of how big is your market. Um, you know, like uh, Kenneth was talking about, uh, you know, there's lots of pools in Florida, right? So he's, he's in a space that there's a massive amount of uh, opportunity. So I always say, go look at how big is your market and um, and and can you leverage even more within that market? So he may launch that one product and he may add something on a little bit later too. go, aha, I should have done that. I can do that now, right? Um, and then I go back to um, who's going to write you the check, right? So your widget maker may be the most amazing thing ever. Who's going to give you money for it, right? And so when you're looking at your product, you almost have to decide, and I always look at it and say, try and design it for them. So if, if you're making a widget maker for a, for a homeowner who's gonna be in their garage on the weekend, you probably don't want it really high tech and, and whiz bang. It has to be easily understood and simplified. Um, and then you, you, you just gotta know who you're, who's going to write you the check and then make your product for them. So if it's for, uh, if it's for Home Depot, 
right? You got to think about how many stores do they have, volume, quantities, all those sort of things. Um, can you turn them fast enough? Are they going to sit there and hold them for a long time? So they like stuff that turns. So you're going to have to build, let me go back to for, for those people. Um, and then you come back to and you say, well, I have the coolest thing ever. And um, it's the most amazing thing ever. And I know because uh, somebody told me so when I described it to them. So then you go back to and you say, well, who else says so, right? So if it's your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your cousin, your uncle, your, your uh, spouse, you can't trust them, right? They're going to lie to you. They're going to tell you how wonderful it is. And they, they come at you from love and they want to tell you it's just amazing, right? Um, beyond that, it's great to have their support. But beyond that, you have to be able to talk to people that you trust and know and understand that you could maybe share ideas with who you don't worry about stuff walking off, right? Um, so one of the things we always talk about at our at our shows is that, or our meetings is um, speak in generalities, right? So when when you're going to try and describe your product to somebody, you don't have to tell them it's a, a four foot shovel with a, it's painted gold. It has a 45 degree angle with a, a stainless steel tip and a, a rubber mounted uh, handle on the tip on the, I mean, it's just, you speak in generalities, right? I have an amazing way to make a shovel three times more productive, right? Um, so you don't want to, you don't want to, especially if you're on the internet or anything like that, as you expose things sometimes, and it's now in the public domain, right? So in the United States, that means that you may not be able to patent it, depending on what you did. If you go put it on Facebook and describe it and show everybody and, and show it working, I've had patent attorneys that go, no, nah, now you're in trouble, right? So I know we're all excited and we want to go out and show it, but you have to do it in the right way or to the right, to the right crowd, if that makes sense, or trusted confidants. Uh, that sort of thing. So, um. Bob, can I interject, interrupt you there and ask you sure. what you think of um, an NDA and who who would you sign your NDAs with? I mean, have you signed an NDA with your manufacturer, for instance, or with your friend? Yeah, you do, right? But so a patent, just like an NDA, <laughs> is, um, it, it's really there to try and keep people from taking your stuff. But are you going to go sue somebody because they oh, they violated your NDA, right? You got to look at these things and think about it. Um, it's good to have them in place. Um, there's a certain point that it makes sense, uh, especially if you're going to expose the uh, things that the world wouldn't know about it. And it often makes sense. You have to look at it and see if it if you make it a sort of a common NDA where it's you both are exposing things to each other. Uh, like if we're we're talking to a a manufacturer, you know, and they tell us, well, we're going to do, uh, you know, 5 million of these things. Well, they don't want me exposed to them, but the other guy I might be working with that these, oh, by the way, these guys do 5 million of those, right? Um, so you're, you're, you're really, it's a mutual sometimes, um, sort of in the beginning, but as you go forward, the patent or the patent, provisional patent um, protects you sort of on that side of things. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so then the other question I always ask, and I'm sure Dennis and Karen have heard this before, I always say, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, All right? Um, do you want to be a manufacturer? Do you want to be a retailer? Do you want to be a licensee, a licensor? But you really need to know what you're trying to do. What's your strategy? What are you trying to achieve? How are you going to get I go back to who's going to write you the check, right? Um, you know, with, I'll, I'll go back to the Wonder Widget. Um, you know, you're probably going to spend at least five years of your life, whatever it is you're chasing and pushing and getting through. You better really love what you're doing and there better really be a market, right? <laughs> and, then, um, and then you got to figure out who is that market and then how am I going to get to that market? Am I going to go... If I've never been a manufacturer before, am I going to go try and manufacture, you know, or am I going to go to China and have somebody else manufacture it? Um, am I going to 
if I can I license it in my own country, uh, those sort of things. Um, so I'm, I see you have Stephen Key coming on here. Stephen's a friend of mine. He's a really good guy. He, uh, he spoke to our group. He came to Jacksonville a couple of years back and spoke to us. He's a really, really, really good guy. Um, and I would, I would recommend you guys. He's got a ton of free videos, him and Andrew. Uh, do if you go on his site on inventright.com, I think it is. Um, I'm sorry. Okay. I think it's just a mic. Um, so, so there you go. Can you mute yourself, please? That's good. Um, Dolly? Yes. <laughs> Hi, Celeste. Hi there. Welcome. Um, is it, can we hear the background noise from you? Uh, let, you know what? Let me go in another room. Okay, thank you, I'm Dolly. sorry. Thank you. No okay. problem. No worries. Thank you. All right. So, so I go back to what do you want to be when you grow up? You really, you really need to do a lot of research and figure it out sort of before you get going, because you know, what's your background? You have a uh, hundred thousand dollars to go buy prototypes or create prototypes, or once you get them done, do you have distribution? Do you know how you're going to sell it? Do you know what your margins are? So that's really what you almost, you're, you're creating a business and a lot of inventors haven't been in business before, right? And that's that is a that is a little bit of a um, a hurdle that if you're not familiar with business, you sort of have to learn business, right? And but it's good. And it's cool thing is that you're really the inventing. Inventing for me is really a process. It's um, trying to figure out get your you know, all these things you have to figure out, and then how do I get it done? And then how do I get it sold? Right. So it always comes down to execution. Everybody here has probably had a ton of amazing, good ideas, but can you execute? Right. Um, Stephen always talks about, you know, big ideas take a long time, right. Um, a, you know, a comb that's designed a little bit different may not take that long. A bioplastic <laughs> that is soil and marine biodegradable it takes a long time, right? So, or Karen, yeah, Karen's got some designs on some airplanes. <laughs> She's heard this from me before. Um, that are very Big cool. <laughs> the, the, Big they're very cool. They're very cool, but they're very intricate, right? And so, how do you leverage into those things? Well, you have to have help. You have to have cash flow. You have to. The whole goal is if you can license, that's a much easier process. So. Um, so those are two really completely different paths. Uh, and does it make sense if you want to manufacture, maybe you want to be in the manufacturing business. That's cool. If you want to manufacture your own business, God bless you. But you got to know about manufacturing. If you don't know it, you got to learn it. So, um, and then if you're going to license, then you have to know what's that process all about. And I think it's great you guys are bringing Steven on because he's got some some really, really good insights on those sort of things. Um, I know Dennis has licensed, um, he's licensed some products and, you know, it's, it's a process. And you, what you're really doing is you're going into, you're becoming a partner with that company or that person. And so you really have a business partner per se, but some people want you to just get out of the way. And I get that. You don't want to be a, you don't want to be a hovering inventor and, and drive a, you don't want to drive Coca-Cola crazy if they don't want you around. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so, uh, but if they want you, then you, you know, you, you, you help them and you beforehand, you write that into your agreement that they might have to pay you for ongoing consulting on how to do things. Right. Um, so, but let me go back to it. You, you better love it. Right. Cause if you're going to go launch a product, you're going to spend a lot of time figuring this out and then the whole business of the business because it is a business right um you're gonna have to either figure out the manufacturing and distribution business or you're gonna have to figure out the licensing business all right uh, good news there's lots of smart people out there who can help you lots of different roads i think 
for me, it makes sense to license because everything I touch is on just a massive scale. Um, I, there's no way I can cash flow. You know, from what I can tell in the United States, an area about the size of Ohio goes under plastic mulch every year for agricultural film. Well, there is no way I can cash flow Ohio. All right. So I got to get in with the right brands who already have that distribution. They already have the contacts and those sort of things. So my goal is to try and design a company that creates what I call mailbox money, right? You want to check every quarter or whatever that, that they, you get, you don't have to be greedy, but I need a kiss off everything, right? So um, I'm a big believer in reoccurring revenue. I like reoccurring revenue, but you know, if somebody walks up and goes, we want you gone, we're going to write you a check. You can look at that too. I mean, there's nothing wrong with money up front either, right? Um, if you're going to license and then you have to make sure that you have some way to hold them accountable, uh, that you're actually going to get paid um, and that they're going to generate the kind of volume that you require. So if you license to these guys and they just stick it in a shelf somewhere, you're not going to make any money if your contract is written. It's only based on sales, right? So you have to you have to get with sort of the smart, pretty people who understand that stuff. Steven's one of those guys. He gets it. He's licensed a ton of stuff. Um, and he's super approachable, super helpful. So um, your Bob, process. Can I ask you to, sure. can, I, can I interrupt you and ask sure. you to talk a little bit about your biodegradable plastics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I have a patent on a mulch bag or, or soil bag where a lot of mulch is sold in plastic bags here. And I would do installations and we'd have a thousand empty plastic bags to throw away. And I thought this is insanity. So we filed a patent on a biodegradable mulch bag that it, it folds open. And basically you just spread the mulch over the bag, the bag stays in place and, you, and it blocks weeds. And then ultimately it biodegrades and goes away. So you eliminate the plastic bags you eliminate the weeds and we eliminate Roundup and herbicides because the bags work really well. So it's kind of a triple win, right? So all the research I can do, it looks like there's at least 3 billion bags a year in the U.S. that are sold um, of mulch and maybe even more now. But um, so that product led me to, I had to find a plastic and I couldn't find a plastic, right? I tested everything, all the, and that's still the stuff that's out there now. Um, a lot of people claim things are biodegradable and they aren't, they're actually compostable. And that's a completely different thing, at least here in the United States. It's, uh, if you're, we're, for us, we're, we are soil and marine biodegradable, meaning that if my plastic hits the ground or it hits the water, we're going to biodegrade. And if you take my stuff and you throw it in a dump, I wouldn't recommend that because you can't claim landfill biodegradable. So, um, so you have to get with people who know what they're doing. So the guy that I've been working with for almost a decade now, uh, when we started on this, nobody even really cared about plastic. It's really been interesting the last year to watch the world all of a sudden throwing rocks at plastic. Um, and so we're in a good position because uh, we figured out how to make a really, really strong, very, very stretchy. We test almost as strong as polyethylene and we're actually a little more ductile or stretchy than um, than polyethylene is. And then we last a long time and then we die, right? So for a lot of, inst for a lot of uh, um, applications, that's what I have to do. I have to find out what would be a good application that does that or needs that, right? So as I take that plastic, I'm leveraging it into other products and other markets. So like the agricultural film, um, that is a massive, that is a massive plastic pollution. I, we call it uh, pl uh, persistent plastic particulate pollution, right? So all those little microplastics, um, they all wind up staying in the soil and or they wash into waterways and things like that and can affect fish and marine wildlife. So ours will get consumed. So if they, you use a regular plastic, you're gonna roll it up and you're going to take it, pay to uh, run it to the landfill. Uh, with ours, you just till it into the bed um, in, in the farm. So, you know, I go back to who writes the check and what do they want? Well, 
they don't want to go to the landfill. They don't want to have to deal with all that. They don't want plastic waste on there. Because, you know, if you've got 500 acres, that's an asset. And the last thing you want to do is go out there and pollute that asset uh, with all this plastic problems. Because year after year after year, you're continuing to add layers of plastic. You know, as you, And when you roll it up, all those microplastics break off because the sun, the UV, tends to make the plastic brittle. So we solve that problem, right? Um, and then looking at other things, we've got, uh, I've got a ton of products. I've got five provisionals that are, I should have finished in the next week or so, but, um, we can do, um, we're doing some really interesting thing with string trimmer line. Um, I'm going to be talking to a mass. Some interesting things work. What's that? I didn't pick up what you were saying. You can do some really interesting things with a string trimmer, so like a weed eater. Okay, okay. Right. So you don't realize that plastic it creates um, it, from all the studies we can read it creates uh, eleven thousand microplastics and thirteen point two billion nanoplastics per minute. So that's a lot of microplastics. So and then when you come out every week and you run that equip that uh, that line. It just happens week after week after week after week. So you get this persistent plastic particulate pollution all over your landscapes and it moves it all into the waterways and those sort of things. So like I say, you look at it, you go, well, what can I leverage? We're working with some people on some plant tags um, for potted plants. Um, some of these are in the hundreds of millions of items. Um, so like I say, the big ideas take a long time. I just got, my chemist just emailed me. We've been trying to get this done for, gosh, it's been about seven months, but in November, we're going to be able to get time on the uh, extruder and, and be able to do our, our testing. And if that works, I've got two manufacturers, actually, I've got a third one because I have another application. So we can do what's called sheet extruding. So it, it basically runs, a, it makes a wide, flat, and you can adjust the thickness material and they can run that through printers. And so they can plant tags and signs and things like that. So um, I'm just going back um, a step. Your, your plastic that you were talking about that you're going to be using for mulch for mulch bags. Mm -hmm. Can you use that same product in the string from a line? Mm -hmm. Okay, so in fact, it's, it's a transferable product, can you say? Any yep. use of plastic. So um, if, could, if could it ends it up, so, so plastic always comes down to end of life, right? So where's it going to end up? So if we end up in water or we end up in the soil, we're a good choice. If you're going to end up in the landfill, just buy regular yeah. plastic, right? Or if it's going to go in a composting, an industrial composting facility, then we're a good choice. Um, but we're more expensive than plastic and that's one of the reasons there's so much plastic because it works really well and it's really cheap so that's why everybody uses it right the problem is it's got a, an expensive environmental impact that uh, you, that now the governments are starting to realize and so they're they're coming after the manufacturers for long-term costs to manage those those plastic problems so we're a we're a side that doesn't do that. We we figured out how to do a really cool grocery bag that's multi-use, uh, made out of our material. Um, we've I've got about five or six things that are just kind of revolutionary that's going to change a lot of industries. Sadly, I can't talk about those right now because we're we're in process. But um, see, that's how you do it. You just talk general, right? Um, I'm just pursuing your 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 product. Is it also food grade? Yes, yeah, so we are, uh, we're BPA free, phthalate free, PFAS free. We have soil non-toxicity. We can do food contact. Um, we, uh, we're, we can be bio preferred. We're, we're well over 50% uh, um, bio-based. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lot of, it, it, it checks a lot of the boxes. So, um, so there's a lot of applications for it. And as I continue to go through and, and have an aha moment, right? Um, 
I do the research. I look how big is that market? What does it look like? Who retails it? Who would be interested? Is that a viable product for that application? Because we don't work at, we're not going to work for everything, but there's a lot of stuff we will work for. So um, it's, it's, that's how you have to look. I guess talking about uh, Kenneth with his uh, pool thing is that he's probably going to get in there. He'll be working with it. And then ultimately he may decide, uh, well, by the way, I figure I can do this too, right? Or they could use this for this application. Or if I make this little tweak, and that's what happens. Um, I think, Karen, you got a bunch of patents, don't you? A lot of provisionals, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, so that's, you know, it, it's what happens is it's a group of people that think like that, right? And so you're always looking to try and improve and do better and better and better. Um, and so the hard part is getting to execution, right? And then, like I said previously, you have to know what do you want to execute toward? Are you want to execute toward licensing? Do you want to execute towards manufacturing? Do you want to flat out sell it? Um, but those are things you have to make decisions on in your own life. So um, I would tell you to always, uh, your process is going to be a series of failures. I mean, you're absolutely going to make a, a ton of mistakes. It's just what it's just how it works. Um, Best way to learn it is, and and often those will lead you to some completely other different discovery. So it's okay to fail because fail is just a a gaining of knowledge that may give you another light bulb that goes, well, wait a minute, I could do this over here, and this market's like five times that size, right? So. It's, it's really the process of in, inventing, I think, is, um, is important that you, you look at all the different aspects um, of, of what it can do, what it could be. Um, and then, like I say, if you have a thing that's really big, those take a long time. Um, and if you've got easier things sometimes you know there's a lot of people develop easy products and license those very rapidly i would love to do that but for some reason i decided i had to take the long road right um, but but it's a massive it is a every market that i have solutions to are just staggering i mean mathematically they're staggering um and so you they just take time they just take a while and you have to that you have to just plow through. Um, and like I say, in, in plowing through, you're often going to come into another aha moment that you may abandon your first idea and go chase the second idea um, because you, you realize this one's actually a better way to do it. So and, true. Yeah. And so uh, it- Bob, Bob, if I could go back to your product, your mulch bag, is it on the market already? It's not yet. We're. Um, are, are you still so, testing? Well, we're 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 complete with testing. It does very well. So one of the problems we ran into with COVID, um, it shut down just about every freaking plant in the country, and people wouldn't let you in. So I can't get in to do our testing at all these what they call converters, right? So um, you're going to take a material and convert it into something else, and so. This one, like I said, this November, we've been trying to get into that one for seven months, six and a half, seven months. Um, I have a customer ready to go who wants 35 million of something. Uh, you just got to get through and, you, and hope the testing works, right? Um, if not, you, you tweak it and you adjust it and, and those sort of things. But that's just one little bitty. That's just one. I say one bitty. It's, it's one. It's just one direction. And I've currently working about 10 different directions right now here's my list uh there's a ton of them right every one of those is a really big project so it takes time and so you have to be able to support yourself also financially right um but if you can take one and you can drive it through god bless you do that because it's uh you got to get you got to get to capital right you only have so much time and treasure and talent um, and so you, you have to decide where do you want to spend your time or your money? Um, so I would always say if, if you can make things happen quickly, that's, that's better. Um, cause it'll, you know, after a while you start getting tired, you start getting worn down you start doubting yourself, uh, those sort of things. But 
as far as the mulch bag itself, we haven't been able to get in. So we're trying now, we've working with another converter and we're hoping we can get in in the next uh, three months. So if we can get in there, then I'll have be able to manufacture and get going for spring in Florida for the mulch bags, right? So my okay. idea with that is I'll sell those, right? And I'll probably advertise them here locally. And what typically will happen is people will go to the big box stores, the Home Depots and the Lowe's and go, hey, I want that product. They're going to go, what product, right? And so sometimes you have to build it at a certain scale in order to get the market to say yes and, and test out the market. Because uh, we're all making assumptions, right? We are assuming that people are going to want it. We're going to assume that the cost is going to be this, may or may not be. We're going to assume that we can sell it for this, uh, may or may not be right. Um, we assume it's going to perform a certain way. And, and you really don't know until you start getting out there testing stuff. And um, it's just a series of tests. And so th this will be more of a market test, right? Um, so anyway, that's that's what we're doing there. But it's I, I think the big thing is pick... Just go, just go through the process. Just take it through and you're going to find you change your mind and your direction. I, I'm guessing people on here have probably run into that too. You, you, you shift gears um, and, and move to other directions and that's okay. Um, so. Um, well, can I ask you um, a, a sort of a general opinion question as it were? Sure, absolutely. Um, you, you've spoken about entrepreneurship about venturing um, and you've been very involved in that and you also spoke about quite a lot about licensing in a general sense what are the similarities between the two in terms of the kind of inventor you need to be um, do you think that uh, if you're going to license a product you're a very different kind of character from somebody who's going to venture it well, let me let me back up. So, so the only thing I would say that is different is, um, you may not have been kicked enough if you think you want to go manufacture, right? <laughs> you, haven't, you haven't you haven't been beaten down yet, right? <laughs> so, I mean, licensing is definitely an easier play, um, but some people want to manufacture. I mean, that's okay if if the margins there and you have those skill sets and those assets and the time and treasure to do it, God bless you, you know, move ahead. Um, but there are different types of, there's different personality styles, but, um, and that's what I always talk to. I, at a lot of the meetings and things, I'll get people come up to me afterwards and I'm like, well, I want to do this. Well, it sounds cool. Okay. Well, I want, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to manufacture this, that, and the other. Well, what do you know about manufacturing? Uh, nothing, but this is a cool product. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready to write it? You know, put your house mortgage on the line. Is it that cool? Because you might have to, right? So, so you got to know where you're. You got to know. We have a saying, you know, crying uncle. You know, I mean, I give up. You know what I mean? You got to know where you're, how far you're willing to go financially, time wise, and all these different things. But if your market's big enough or it's profitable enough go. But, you know, years ago, I went into the patent office when, in DC, and it was 15 foot ceilings, as far as the eye could see, of patents in these, that's when it was used to be paper, is this entire building was just covered with all these patents. So we started digging through the patents and looking at them. A lot of it, you look at it, and you're like, oh, my God, why would somebody patent that? I mean, it's ridiculous, right? So. Um, Sometimes people patent because it's kind of an ego stroke, if that makes sense, because um, they they just think it's cool, but they don't ever do anything with it. Um, you'll see that sometimes they don't realize that it, it is a absolute commitment of time and effort to get something to fruition. So a lot of these products that I have, um, I'm going to meet a massive manufacturer next week. Um, on one of my products. Uh, I was at a sod field today um, looking at how they're growing things. And there's two products that I can provide those people using my material that they were very interested in, right? So, so that's what I'm saying. You just, you always be aware 
trying to figure out how big the market is, um, who would buy it, and and what is that? What does that person think? Um, generally, because you're only going to describe it generally, right? Um, I would tell you to read and study everything you can relating to your product and to the competitors' products within that marketplace. Um, you're going into business and you are in the inventing business. And so, you know, out of normal businesses in the United States, there's only about two out of 10 that survive the first year. There's about one out of 10 that survives the first three years, right? Business is hard. So licensing, I think, and you'll see Stephen talk about that. It's a way to leverage the market without you having to be a manufacturer, without you having to be good at distribution or web pages and all the things it's going to take to cash flow that to get it to market. Um, licensing, now you're not, you might only make five or 10 cents a unit, but if there's enough units, right? Okay. And you don't, and you don't have any skin in the game other than your, your intellectual property. Um, if you remove it now, if you remove it from, from the market, and I always say, if people are like, oh, wow, that's great. We want to, uh, we want to be the only one. Cool. I'm glad you want to write a check that big. Right. Um, Cause you're, you really, if I'm going to pull it out of the market and give it to you, you, that's my revenue line. I have a, I have a decreasing revenue line, right. Over time. So, and the other thing I think that that gets overlooked a lot is uh, trademarks. So in the States, a patent is 17 years plus three years of development typically to get it approved. So around 17 to 20 years for a, that's for a utility patent. Um, a trademark is a hundred years, right? So I always go back to, there's a product over here called Scott's miracle Grow. So it's a fertilizer by the Scott's company, right? And it's a well-known brand, um, great marketing. That gentleman, there was a gentleman that was a sole proprietor owned a product called miracle Grow, And it was a liquid fertilizer. And he'd go to all the trade shows for 25 years, sit there by himself and try and sell product. And then at the end, he ultimately sold it to Scott's. Well, Scott's didn't want the product. They wanted the trademark, right? So it became Scott's miracle Grow. Pretty smart. So you got to look at the other thing is what is your intellectual property? Is it, there's a lot of value in trademarks if you can brand under, uh, if you can get under the right brands. Um, I was going to try and show you my new, I just did a trademark change. Oh boy, where'd I put it? Um, so I'm changing my logo, the look of my logo. Um, well, here we go. I'll try not to reveal too much, but um, so that logo, you can see that weed recede. Um, it used to be a very industrial looking uh, kind of choppy blocky line. Well, I got with this guy who is brilliant and we basically redesigned that logo and pulled in the sort of the magic and then the, uh, you know, made it look like a, a, a sort of the flower sort of. Uh, so, you know, it's just a different feel, right? So my goal then is I'm going to brand a lot of my products under the weed receipt brand. So I'm trying to give strength to that weed receipt brand as a trademark value, right? So I can do a lot of products under that brand, under that, under the weed receipt. So I worked with this on a, uh, with a contractor who is really, really good. I mean, there's, there's just certain people that are head and shoulders above the rest. Um, and you see it in their work and, yeah, it cost me a little bit of money, but it's not that much. Uh, like I say, if you're looking at a hundred year asset and you can leverage it to where corporate looks at it and goes, that's cool. We want to be part of that. Don't cheap out on your logos. Get somebody who knows what the heck they're doing. Um, Bob, so. this is Karen. I, that's the first thing I do on any invention. As I go for a brand, I get domains on it. I get art yep. on it. That's the very first thing. Yep. And if I don't use it later, fine. But if I do, right. wow. <laughs> yeah. And if you can get the domain, you definitely want that. 
right? Because then you can leverage that and somebody can't take it from you. So um, yeah, absolutely get the domains, right? The dot coms uh, if you can. So um, yeah, that's good, good, good stuff, Karen. Absolutely right. Um, so the other thing that you need to do is if you think you've got an idea, you really love it, you think the rest of the world loves it, your whole family loves it, um, you think it's doable, you think it's sustainable, um, you need to go do a patent search, right? So here we have the USPTO, US Patent and Trademark Office, and they've really cleaned up their website in the last few years. They, it's really a lot easier to search. So you want to go find your idea. Even though you don't want to go find your idea, you want to go find your idea. Because the last thing you want to do is go spend a bunch of time, money, and effort chasing something. Go pay a lawyer to do a, an in-depth search. Might cost you $1,000, $1,500. And then you get to that, you spend all that time, effort, whatever, and you get to the end, they go, well, you know, here in 1979, um, somebody did this and it's prior art. So no, you can't cover it. So you want to know that first, right? You don't want to go spin in your wheels. So I would tell you to search that product any way you could ever think of, right? So um, use different terms, use different sayings, use different, however you can say it, search that. Because if it's there, you want to find it. I just missed one. A couple of years back, we did a cursory search, couldn't find it. Um, it was a pretty cool idea. We basically took um, like these ratchet straps that you, you, you tie down things and you ratchet them down and they think, well, every time I would use one, they'd always fall off. So I was like, well, why don't we magnetize the ends of them, right? And so you're working on trailers, you just stick the one on, you come over and it doesn't fall off. Well, Patent attorney thought it was a great idea. I thought it was a great idea. We couldn't find it. And then all of a sudden he did a search and he goes, uh-oh. And it, it had gone through like the year before. And, and But I wish I had found that earlier, right? Instead of spending the money. The lawyer felt bad and didn't charge me. Right? Because <laughs> we had spent a bunch of time on it, right? Um, so that's the other thing is get a good patent attorney that you can trust. Um, the thing here in the United States is you want somebody, you, you probably don't want your local Yahoo patent attorney. If, you're, if this thing is good and it's worth protecting, you want somebody who knows what they're doing and could go up there and, and debate at the USPTO and if it had to go to court or anything like that. So you want a really good patent attorney. And you typically find those by asking others, right? and then doing your own research and figuring out who they are. So an inventors group like you're doing is great because you probably have eight or 10 or 15 people who could probably recommend somebody They go, oh yeah, he was great, I loved him. Or, oh my God, don't use him, right? Um, so that's some of the things you get out of an, an inventors group is, is those sort of things. Um, and then- um, Bob, can I just interrupt you there? We're yeah. coming up to the end of the meeting. We've mm -hmm. got about eight minutes or so. Mm -hmm. Could I ask the audience, are there any questions, by the way, for Bob? Yeah, absolutely, please. Nick, would you like to go ahead? Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Bob, thanks for a, a wonderful information. I've, I've just thoroughly been immersed in everything you've said. Well, thank you for the kind words. I'm going to challenge you on one item of credibility. May I do that, please? Sure, absolutely. I don't believe you're 59 years of age. <laughs> oh, I like him. <laughs> I'm serious about that anyway. That's just by the by. But, um, you know, he's, he's in sales. <laughs> they, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's all awesome out there. You know, Bob, you've, I've, I've rec quite recently, although I'm an old dog, I've recently been this journey and I'm busy. Um, I've just licensed a product in the US, which I'm absolutely thrilled about. And I loved your re reference to um, becoming the hovering inventor. <laughs> because everything signed and sealed, and I've had some payments up front. I don't know what they're called. Yeah. I think they're goodwill in, um, in uh, payments of intent. 
but I don't know where the project is. I don't know how it's doing. And I don't, I'm not at all a fay, because I'm relatively new to this, this um, industry of inventing, what the etiquette is. Do I shut up and bite my, my tongue or do I kind of so politely? So is there money tied to performance on their end? Yes, it, well, it's, it's, it's based on, on royalty, but there are, the payments you know, of intent have been made already. Okay, that's good. The second one due shortly. Okay. So and, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing to send them an email and go, hey, thank you for the first payment. Uh, I really look forward to working with you guys. If there's anything I can do for you, please feel free to reach out to me. I don't want to distract you or bother you. Just know I'm always available. And yeah, you're the inventor. And, yeah. and there's nothing, you talk about etiquette. There's absolutely nothing wrong with you making an inquiry and, right. and offering to help. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Look, th thank you for that. As I say, um, and quite honestly, I'm probably a little bit naive in, in, this, in this industry. Well, congratulations so on your license. I mean, that's great. That's fabulous. Good for you. Thank you. Um, Bob, I'm sure there are others to ask questions, so I'm going to get on to, to something else. Um, but I love that hovering inventor. I thought that was great. Um, dumping of an idea. Um, have you done that in your career as an inventor, where you've just had to say, enough, no more, this thing. I thought there was a market for it. There isn't. Um. Yes. But that's difficult. We all yes. love our inventions as yes. our children. Yes. So one of those was on that magnetic uh, uh, ratchet, right? I had yeah. to stop, yes. right? And I didn't <clears throat> want to stop because I really wanted to do that one, right? Um, uh, I've had others where I, I look at it and I... So really, it's, it's kind of a what-if game. It's, you know... What if I did this? Or what if I did it that way? Or what if the market's big enough? Or, or what if these people are interested? Or what if it sits out in the rain? I mean, you're really, you're trying to figure out all those different things. And sometimes, yeah, you'll come to stuff where you go, dang, that's not a good application for it. I thought it was, but it's, it's not. And then you just move on. Uh, but like I say, that's good because you, it, it's cheaper to go through that process. It's a, it's a process of discovering. Um, and so you have to be honest it, with yourself. Yeah, absolutely. You, you do have to be. This honest. is an extreme. This it's, is Karen. The biggest. This is Karen. I think the biggest difference between a successful inventor and one who isn't is their ability to give up and move on. It's too yeah. many people stick to an idea. It becomes their passion and it's not a good idea. It's not going to make it in the market. You need to move on. Yeah, I see that all the time. I, you've seen some of the people at our groups, they come in and they, they've got these great ideas, they think, and you're like, good Lord, I can't think anybody would even write a check for that. I even buy one of them, you know what I mean? So so I sometimes I'm very, uh, I'm brutal with people, but I'm honest with people. And I, I think, I think <clears> you have, I mean, I have people that are honest with me and they'll tell me, what the heck are you talking about, Bob, right? Or um, my chemist I work with, he's telling me no all the time. Well, what if we did this? No, that's not, no, wrong market, wrong application. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I'll move to something next. Karen's right, and so is Dennis. It's, uh, you got to move on. And, and yeah, unless you can find another way to tweak it, what if, what if I just change this a little, right? But it, it needs to lay up against all those things. Who's going to write you the check? How big's the market? Um, can you find a willing buyer? or a licensee, right? So you were able to do that. God bless you. That's good stuff. Um, but remember, I, I these guys, are, they're looking for stuff. You know what I mean? They are, they do want things. They want to stand out. So did I, I answer your question? Back a little bit, Bob, just to your what if game. Mm -hmm. if, if, if the inventor is asking those what if questions, mm -hmm. it would see that they're listening to what somebody's saying to them. If they don't want to have a, no, 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 I know, I know, no, this is how it's going to work. No, it, it, it's blue. It's got to be blue. And it doesn't matter. They don't listen. Um, right. So it's actually a good sign if they're saying, what if we do this or change yes. the color, the shape, the size, the design, whatever. Yes, yes. So, 
Yeah, you look, uh, feedback is always good. Have I got any other questions? Are there any questions? Can I ask you, Karen? Your yes. one best tip that you've got for inventors, what might that be? Um, what Bob is saying is correct. I, you really got to do your patent searches. Google patents is excellent. And don't become overly passionate about a single idea. I've burned up and wasted a lot of my life. I'm older than Bob. I'm 63. And I'm, wow. after all those years, I'm only now getting seriously into inventing. I spent too much time being passionate about a pro 20 years on one project. Ridiculous. Just because I loved it. And I took it to a trade show and I got over half a million people said they love it, but not a single one put up a check. All right. So now I'm working on projects now that the checks will come. I'm not a particular fan of EV technology, electric cars, but there's a great need for supporting technology to help people own EV cars more, yeah. more effectively. And so that's what I'm working on now. I've got several provisional patents going on now for technology. It's not romantic. It's not pretty, but it'll help regular consumers own electric cars more efficiently. And I think there'll be a market for it. And then once I get my license deals on that, then I'm going to go back to some of my passionate projects. But it's all about the money. Karen, tell, yeah, tell them about, uh, tell them about your, uh, your space shuttle uh, lens that you created. Oh, yeah. Back when they, they were launching um, the space shuttles, they were solid fuel rocket engines. And they were scared to death to have reporters, photographers too close to the space shuttle. So they came to me. I was a professor at a local college at the time. And they came to me and they, they said, we have to be three miles or more away from this thing. And we don't have any cameras that can see it that far. So I built one, a giant uh, uh, camera system that looked like a uh, missile launcher and uh, we took it down there and were able to see the the windows on the cockpit of the space shuttle and look in them from three miles away and and it scared the NASA people so much they sent out soldiers to make sure it wasn't a missile launcher but <laughs> but I was I was just a kid it was it was fun it was great and uh, but no I thought outside the box. Nobody else did that. And then that technology went on. And for the next launches, other people started having versions and so on and so forth. And those are my pre-patent days. <laughs> well, and, and one of the things you don't think about is when you're that far away and that missile's going up in the air, how do you track that, right? Because it's yes. very, any little wiggle and you've solved that problem, didn't you? Yeah, I, the, the, the tracking stand weighed over a thousand pounds and had a cushioning system in it. So as the shuttle went off, I mean, that thing goes <laughs> off. Several seconds after the engines fire, you get a blast of vibration that'll shake any camera to pieces. And we solved that by sheer weight and a massive tracking system that could stop the vibration. And uh, yeah, it was useless on the market. Who's going to buy such a thing? But it was pretty cool. A lot of fun to use too. It's <laughs> on my website. I've got pictures of it. <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Karen. Are there any other questions or any other comments that people want to make? I would like to make a quick comment. I, I just came from working with our local high school um, and, and teaching a bunch of these high school kids stuff I wish that I had the chance to learn when I was their age. But Bob made reference to you got to do your patent search and you really do want to find what you're after. And I tell these students, I said, look, here in the U.S. alone, there are 350 million people. I guarantee you that the idea that you have, somebody else has thought of. But when you find it, you have and, and, and you, you realize, oh, I thought of this problem. And here's the way I want to solve this problem. And then you go out there and you find out that other people have solved that problem pretty much the way you were thinking of. I said, number one, you should take heart because that's confirmation that it's a legit problem and confirmation that your solution has some viability. But then you flip that coin over and you ask yourself, but why didn't I know about it? So what is it that they, that they did that was a little bit unfulfilling, a little bit deficient? That's where the opportunity lies. And sometimes um, it, it's a matter of 
maybe you're making a watch and it's somewhere between a Timex and a Rolex. Well, Timex and Rolex have two very different markets and they both sell a lot or they make a lot of money. Rolex maybe doesn't sell a lot in quantity, but they make a lot in money. And there's all kinds of market in between. And we're telling these students the same thing. And, and some of the products they were talking about, it's like, well, you've got the low end solution um, for like a, you go into Walmart and you buy it for 10 bucks or you can go to your doctor and he can prescribe one and it costs you a lot more money. I said, maybe you guys have the real opportunity to find something in between. And so to Bob's point, you do want to find it. And you, number one, you want to find it early and decide whether or not it's worth your pursuit. But then you find out what these other people have done and you use that information. You learn everything you can and you go solve the problem a little bit differently. You get around their patent if necessary. Um, but you, you cannot do enough information gathering. You always are looking because that feedback will help you refine your idea or decide I need to fish or cut bait. I need to stop this because it's not worth my effort anymore. I think just to carry on with that, you know, you also um, have got a market within. <laughs> or things she's getting over something. I beg your pardon. No worries. You have a market within a market, can I say? Um, if I could choose a, a different, com a, a completely different example, uh, we've got fast food outlets, McDonald's, we know, um, Wimpy, I believe you don't really have it in the, in the States, but there's Wimpy, there's Wendy's, you've got a different market for Wendy's, Wimpy and McDonald's, and they're all selling hamburgers. So, the, the, you know, there's a, uh, as I said, a market within a market sometimes, even though your product is out there, if it is in some form, is another market that might like your tweak or your innovation. Anyway, on that very wise note, I'm going to say <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Bob. It's been a very interesting hour. And very I'd good. like to hand over to our chairman, uh, Ken Hawksworth, uh, to close the meeting, please. Thank you, Ken. Thanks, Celeste. Yeah, thanks everybody who showed up and, and spoke. It was good. Can I add two real quick things here, finally? <laughs> So one is, I go back to one is discernment, right? So discernment is critical. Uh, and it kind of plays off what everybody was talking about is that just because you love it doesn't mean everybody else does. Who else says so? That matters, right? And then beyond that, it's tenacity. You never, 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 never give up. If you are fully convinced that is the right thing. That is the right product. That is the right market. You just don't stop, right? You have to keep going if you figured it out. That go back to discernment, right? So you go back to, do you chase the wrong thing? And I think you asked me that earlier, Celeste. Um, somebody, did, I can't remember. Um, yeah, have I gone down the wrong road? Yes. Did I stay on that wrong road? No. I decided to bail, just like Karen was saying. It's um, and then discernment comes through wisdom, through age, through, uh, through being in situations to having gone through it before. So, um, but it's, it is straight up tenacity. Um, it's, and, and find a mentor. But can I take, can I say that? Go find somebody who, who is really good. I, I kind of consider Stephen a mentor to me. He, we've had a lot of conversations, Stephen Key, and y'all are going to love him. He's really good. Um, but uh, I, th I think it's it's tenacity. Just just you got to go. If you believe it, go. All right. It, it, time is of the essence. Just go. Thank you, Bob. Mm -hmm. Okay, I better wrap up. Um, I, I think Bob, you've um, you're obviously amongst friends here. We've all had some of the experiences that you've had. Yeah. Um, but we do. I, I like your word about a mentor at the moment because. What actually happens is that when we have our meetings, we're mentoring each other. You are. And one guy is always saying, oh, you know, I had this problem. And somebody else will say, yeah, well, I found a solution. Or for God's sake, don't go there. Right. Been there, done that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you're speaking common ground to all of us. But it was really interesting to listen to you. 
Again. I'd like to ask a couple of questions. Sure. The material for your biodegradable plastic, if you want to call it that, um, was that where you started or did you start with the idea and then sort of material to... I started, I started with the idea and then sought a material and okay. uh, couldn't find a material. So then we and had that's to build. Why That's why it's taken you quite a while. Yes, yeah. And I work with, believe it or not, I, I don't know if any of y'all are God people, but after 20 minutes, of, I prayed about it and I was like, I can't find it. I can't figure it out. God, give me direction. Please help me find the right person. Let me be smart enough to know them when they, when they show up. But 20 minutes later, I get the guy who turns out to be the, he is the head of, he runs a subcommittee that sets ASTM standards for biodegradability of bioplastics for the Bioplastics Institute. This guy's Hello. probably one of the top two in the world. So I, I go back to, don't be afraid to ask for help um, from others and, and from a higher being, I believe, because I, I'm a landscaper. How did I wind up with this guy, right? <laughs> I mean, and, until I asked, right? So um, I, I think there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of truth in, in asking for help from, from what I believe to be God and from others. So. Okay, thank you for that as well. Um, yeah, well, on the basis that God's got a hand in everything, then he's probably a good mentor. Absolutely. I, and I, I love the USPTO. I mean, I've, I've probably, in the last couple of weeks, I've spent quite a few hours there. Luckily, I didn't have to get on an aeroplane. And, and you know, I, I would recommend to any inventor, for goodness sake, yes, go and look hard. Because I'm looking hard and I've, I've come up with so much stuff that I didn't anticipate. And now I'm scratching through it to see what I can cross out and what might be relevant on an idea that I've got at the moment. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the way it goes. So, Bob, thanks again. I think My you, pleasure. your input is going to just reinforce what everybody feels and, and experiences. And we'll all be going down that road and we've been, uh, our wisdoms have been increased by yours. Thank you very much. Indeed. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words. Thank you all for your time. You. And hopefully you'll I see our patents there. Hopefully you'll see some of my products on the market soon. Okay. We need them here too. So on my product, my product is uh, recedebioplastics.com. That's where we basically have a splash page now, and very soon we're going to be updating that page and adding a lot of information to it. But but we'll we'll be posting products as we as we uh, as we get them moving. So um, yeah, good stuff. Okay. Thank you. Good night to everybody outside. Good morning, good day, good afternoon. And thank you very much for coming. Next week, 21st, we've got a sports person coming to talk about inventing for sports people. Cool. So hope to see you then too. Good stuff. Thank you very thank much and good night. All right. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.